Very nice, thank you. Beautiful music. That's a great way to start worship. Just a very brief number of announcements. I invite you to always take a look in the bulletin. We try to keep them up, up to date there. Uh, what's coming up very quickly is our Vacation Bible School, and you see the information there. We are looking for, uh, for kids to get um, registered. They can do so by calling the office or stopping by Monday, Wednesday, or Friday mornings. Um, it is from the 15th to the 19th, so very soon. 4 to 7 p.m. does come with an, a full meal for them. So we hope that you will talk to, you know, um, neighbor kids to look to your grandchildren or if you have children in your home to get them registered. It's going to be a great time. We still could use a few people to help out. So you need to let us know if you are going to be available one day, a couple days, or all five days. Please call the church office as soon as possible so that we can get your name down and get, uh, get you in touch with Angel. The last item I want to uh, talk about is the Apple Bazaar. Now, Apple Bazaar hasn't been held for two years. That's a long time uh, due to COVID, but we are going to hold it this year. The date uh, selected is Saturday, October 15th, which is pretty traditional. And it's going to be all about apples. So we're really going to have apple things this year too, you know, the food and that kind of thing. But we will be doing the traditional aspect as well. So grandma's attic will be available, the bakery will be available, the book table, the jewelry counter, all of those things, the clothing area, which has a lot of clothes for all ages. I found a couple of shirts there myself. So go back there and look. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. That's all going to take place on Saturday, October 15th. There will be food provided. So what we hope you'll do is participate in a couple of ways. One is if you're able to volunteer for that, we will have an opportunity to get together and talk about that very shortly again. Um, we can talk to you today if you want to come back and, and to the fellowship hall. If you think you'd like to know about it or you care to participate, come find me. I'll see if I can find a couple others. We'll have official meetings shortly as well for doing our planning. We're working through that now. Uh, and also, we're going to begin receiving donations on August 15th. So on August 15th, the Marshall House will be open, and it'll be open on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from about 8.30 throughout the day to maybe 2 or 3, and then they'll have some evenings thrown in later on and weekends for you. But initially, uh, I'll have the Marshall, we're asking you to take it to the Marshall House. Now in there, there'll be some signs saying things like clothes, you know, jewelry or glass items, things like that. We just are doing that because it helps us to, to kind of shorten the time it takes to work these things out and, and getting them to their proper locations, books, so forth. So there'll be some general things, and then if you get something and it just doesn't fit there, guess which one is the best and put it there. We'd appreciate that. We're receiving most everything with the exception of electronics. Uh, now, what I mean by electronics, I mean those things that you know that have batteries in them that cannot just be thrown away. So computers, thing, anything that you know you have to take if you can't get rid of it to some collection site and either pay them to take it or wait in line for about you know three days to get to them, that we can't take and we appreciate it if you not burden us with them. But things like transition, or transition huh, transistor radios, things like that, even if they're a little old, people love those things. We're happy to receive that. We aren't taking furniture, and we'd ask you to, you know, to understand why. It's difficult to get in the building, it's difficult to move around with, and we oftentimes end up with a lot of it. And it's difficult, as you know, to get rid of things that people don't want. We don't want to be the place that you get rid of your stuff so we can get rid of it for you. Please take into consideration what we're about. The Apple Bazaar is a time of fellowship and fun to work together and really have some fun. It is fun, by the way. I've enjoyed every single one I've been a part of and try to make it fun myself in my own way. But it is also a time where we're looking to raise some money for the church. The proceeds that we anticipate based on years of experience is part of our budget, part of our income anticipated. So we ask that you come and buy some stuff. You, you'll be surprised what you might find. You might think that it doesn't have anything for you and then come and see what there might be there. I've seen some incredible, incredible quilts, uh, things of that nature, glassware and stuff that apparently that it wasn't something somebody need and we had to figure out what to do with. Beautiful things, items that would make tremendous gifts and they're new. It's not that these are used necessarily. Many of them were very new. So uh, please come and look for things and then join us for food. That would be really important if you would 
take and come ready to buy some of the food that we'll have offered. It's a great way to sit down and, and converse with people. And once again, it does help us with our goal of raising funds for your church. So that's coming up October 15th. Uh, in a week, August 15th, we'll start taking uh, donations. Um, and if you have any questions about what is, if it's okay, if it's something you're wondering about, you can call the office and we will get back to you. And one final small little word, uh, please do bring them in, in good condition. You know, if it's something that you can see is not functional, just throw it out and, you know, and save us, would you? Uh, we, we're looking for things that people are going to want. And I know we get a lot of wonderful things and we get some unusual things. I'll never forget the time I saw Russian made night vision goggles. I thought, that is the most unusual thing I've ever seen, and I didn't buy it, and I wish I had, just so I could say I had one. I don't know why. But where else are you going to find that in the world? And everybody should remember the story of Dave Harsh's famous find of a very valuable pen that he got for next to nothing and determined to find out it was worth a great deal, of which he was gracious enough to donate back. But there was a treasure that no one knew. You might find one. So come and take advantage of that. And bring your friends and tell your friends about it. We can put it on the sign. We can put it in the paper. But the word of mouth of you folks will go a very long way to help us make it a success. All right. I had a lot of announcements. Sorry about that. But I want to now turn to our call to worship. And that's going to be music. So I'm going to put up the slide. And we'll be singing also the uh, doxology, also known as Praise God, From Whom All Blessings Flow. That is in your hymnal. That will not be on the screen. But I think we know it. Okay.
Please be seated if you would. Well, we have one joy to celebrate this morning for sure is the rain. Uh, we desperately needed that rain. The farmers really needed it. The apple growers needed it. It comes at a good time. And I know it's a little inconvenient when we have a weekend, of course. We want to be out and enjoying the beauty of Door County. But think about all the benefit uh, to the creatures that we share this world with, to the, just your, your grass and flowers enjoy it, of course. But the farmers really needed it. We can be grateful and thankful for that. And uh, I pray that this continues on. You know, we, we do live in an agricultural-based uh, county, too. Yes, tourism is the big deal, and that's important, of course. But so is the agriculture that takes place in this county. It's an amazing thing for such a relatively small county to produce so much of God's good produce. So be thankful for that, and, uh, and I hope that it uh, gives us a beautiful and bountiful apple harvest. I just love the apples, so I'm looking forward to that. But there's the hay for the animals, and there's the corn in the fields, and just so many other things. So I'm grateful for that today. I hope you are as well. Any uh, others uh, that I can think of would have to do with people's health. Uh, we had one of our members suffer a minor stroke here a little while ago and is having some recovery issues around that, but he'll be back with us pretty soon. So that, you know, uh, keeping that private, but just keep them in your prayers, just someone you know. And, and, and others, we have many that are going through very difficult times. And you see their names of those that have given us permission in the bulletin. I, I'd invite you to take that bulletin home with you today. If you don't usually, just take it with you. And at some time from, you know, in the little while, just look at those names and pray for them. You, you don't even have to know what it's about, really, do you? I mean, I, I don't know all the details myself, you know, because some things are kept private, but we know they need God's help and intervention in some way. And we have been given the ability to pray. What a great gift. What a wonderful thing. So I would just invite you to do that, and I, I think it would be a really a wonderful thing for them to know, too, that they're being prayed for by their folks that have grown up with them in some cases, that share a church pew with them in some cases, and certainly have shared many a worship service together as well, and simply are just dear friends. Also, please do continue to pray for the circumstances in our nation. We've seen horrible flooding. What is a great thing for us here has been horrible flooding in states like Kentucky and that. People have lost lives and livelihood. They've seen their entire families, things they've owned washed away in their floods. And this is something that is a horrible thing to experience. And it takes years to recover. And, and I know churches will be there. The United Methodist Church is already there through UMCOR and will continue to be. And there'll be churches that are able to go down and help and do things and, you know, and take up funds to help out. And we'll be doing that too when they tell us what and where it's needed. But pray for those folks too. And around the world, I don't need to tell you about all the difficult things going on. People in Taiwan are scared today and they have reason to be. Uh, and you think of places in you like the Ukraine. There's so much. You don't have to agree politically on one side or the other to care about people. I think that's what we're about, don't you? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless us today, we pray. Bless us with the knowledge that we are indeed all your children. Every one of us in this world who live and who have ever lived or whoever will live are your children, beloved by you. Regardless of where they come from, what they believe, what they do with their lives, even when they fail miserably from what you would hope for all of us in expectations of what it means to live faithfully, you love them and you love us. In the midst of all of that, you seek to bring us to a better place in life, to restore us, to help us to live lives that are abundant. That is your gift to us. That is your desire for us. And you show us the way, if only we will open our eyes and see. So bless us today with the knowledge we are loved. We lift up all of those for whom we pray at this time. Some are going through very difficult times, hard times, uncertain times, whether it's their health or their finances, their relationships, their relationship with you, their relationship with others. It could be any number of things. But whatever it is, God, whatever they need most, they need your love, your grace, and the knowledge of that's of the same. So help us to be the kind of people you would call us to be. 
Help us to live as, fellow, as, as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ in all ways that we can. In all things we ask this, asking for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder again that we keep the donation or the offering box back by that door going to the fellowship hall. I invite you to utilize that. There's also online ways of giving, and many choose to use that more all the time. We appreciate that too. It just, it just makes it easier for everybody. But whatever's most convenient to you, we're so grateful that you choose to support this church. I also want to take this opportunity to remind you we do have large print hymnals that are on that back pew back there. They're blue. So if that would be of use to you and you want to put one where you usually sit, go right ahead and do that. That's what they're there for. And also there's back cushions. If that's something comfortable, please take it and use it. We recognize sometimes I have it too. Your back hurts a little bit. It's a little more comfortable. Please take use of that. And we also have available for you hearing assist devices. In this church, there is a, you can see the copper that goes around. That is a direct signal that comes from what I'm saying right now through our system. And it goes to the headphones that are available back there. And you, if you're having difficulty hearing or something like that, we invite you to take one of those and use them. There's the earbud type, there's over the head type. Uh, you just put the unit on, it hangs in front of you, it needs to do that, and you turn it on. It's as simple as that, there's a volume control. So if any time you feel you need abuse of it, use it, please. If you happen to have hearing aids that are equipped with T-cell, it may automatically switch over to the system. You may not even know it and say, boy, this is great. I can hear really well. Well, you're coming directly from the system itself. Some do have to be turned on, and I'm, you'd have to ask your folks that help you with the hearing aids that know how this work, because they're different. But many today are automatic. So that is our system in place. It's also in the fellowship hall. If you're gathered in there for some kind of event, that system also is available there. Same thing goes. The headsets are in here. They're on that back pew. Uh, please do not hesitate to use them. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for all the good gifts we have received in our life and continue to receive. Even if we are not some who have received gifts that are the kinds that others look upon and envy, certainly we don't all have such things and ought not to envy them. But nonetheless, even if we do not have those kinds of possessions and we're struggling in this life, perhaps we're having a hard time paying the bills. Perhaps we're having a hard time keeping our car on the road. These are hard things. And as a community of faith and as a community of a nation that cares, we should all be supporting one another in this. But even in the midst of those difficulties, we're rich. We're rich in your love. We're rich knowing that you love us and care for us and walk with us in all circumstances of life. We're rich in the knowledge that your son, Jesus Christ, so loves us, so loves us that he would give everything to show us that love, to teach us of that love. Everything that he could give, he has given for us. So, Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for that. We want others to know about that love. We support a church that tries to express that love in our own lives and in the life of our community of faith. So help us to be that kind of people. And we pray thanksgiving for the support we receive that helps make that possible. So grant us, Lord, the wisdom and the knowledge of how to use that with which you have entrusted us as the leadership of this church, but also in our own lives, that we might do what is pleasing in your sight. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. There's within my heart a melody, 380.
first scripture reading this morning is from Psalms 19, verse 1. How clearly the sky reveals God's glory, how plainly it shows what he has done. The second one from 2 Timothy, verse three, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living. And finally, from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Somebody took my seat. <laughs> I'll fix that. And all that happened. Would you sing with me wonderful words of life? Continue today with the series concerning a document that was put together by 50 Wesleyan scholars from the United Methodist Church and from other traditions that utilize Wesley's theology in their understanding of what it means to be a church, what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. They call it the faith once delivered, a Wesleyan understanding. And so Today we're turning to the subject of Revelation, but not the book, Revelations, the last book of the Bible. That's not what this is about. It's about revelation in the sense of something that is revealed. Now, for something to be revealed, what that means is it's something that has been hidden from our understanding as if blocked by a veil or a cloth and that is lifted for us to see and understand, or at least it's revealed to us. I kind of think of that like what I think about playing peekaboo with my granddaughter, you know, when she's a little younger. It doesn't work as well when she's a smart four-year-old, but when she was two, it was quite the, quite the thing. And you could hide behind something, and, and, you, and people, you know, where is he? Where'd he go? And you could go, peekaboo. You ever do that? And there's this surprise. You're revealed, right? It's a wonderful thought. Now, God doesn't play peekaboo with us, but in, there's some similarities in how we have things revealed to us as we understand how the Christian faith 
has viewed this from the time of the apostles. And that's what they sought to do. I want to read just one paragraph to you from this particular section of a very long book, um, treatise, but they write, Revelation is not a secondary activity of God. That's very important. Meant to help creation know its creator. Rather, it is part of God's nature to communicate. The Gospel of John makes this clear, identifying Jesus as the incarnate logos, which means word, or in some cases reason, the word made flesh. The grounds, this grounds the claim that revelation is both dynamic and consistent. The word of God is identified as the second person of the Trinity, just as the nature of the Trinity remains consistent across all time and places, so the revelation made available through the word of word is likewise consistent, even as it is translated and expressed in time and place. So that's the statement concerning the, what it means when God reveals. It is God's desire to reveal, but it is also in God's nature, as we understand it, to communicate with us. We didn't initiate it. God initiated it. Now, there's different ways that that happens in, in understanding when we think about this. One of them is called in natural way. Literally, the world around you. I mean, it, were you wakened last night by a very loud you know, boom of thunder and saw lightning outside your window? Is that not a sign of power to you? And it's incredible when you think about it. Because it not only is it the rain, but that lightning releases nourishment for the grass and the plants and everything else. It's a wonderful, beautiful world we live in. And even things that might scare us a little bit, like a sudden blast of thunder, means there is a provision that God has made in the world. There is beauty in the sunset, the sunrise. Is there not? There's beauty in the trees when they turn that lovely autumn color. And, you know, and it's something that speaks to us in a way we can't really describe. I'm not a poet. But I can feel in my heart beauty. It's something I sense and experience. And I know you do too. I don't know how to explain it. There's no very good philosophical or uh, theological way to explain beauty, by the way. Not really. Other than being a gift of God. There's no scientific way to explain it either. Oh, scientists have found a way to explain how the species is, is you know, continued by beauty, perceived beauty in others that attract us, but they can't explain a beautiful sunset and why that somehow in your heart you say, oh my God, or a sunrise, or an autumn leaf, or the face of a child. Beauty is very difficult to try to understand in any other way that it's being a gift of God. That is a natural sort of experience of God that's out there and a way I believe God communicates with us as does the faith once delivered. But you cannot know God through experiencing just the natural world. We cannot then define God and say, well, we know who God is because that would be our effort and that's impossible on our own to do so. Remember, we're like the child behind the veil. But there it is, the beauty of the world that speaks to us about a God of love, but does not really tell us much more than that. That's revelation, but the way that we have come to know God better and why we have things we can speak of is because what theologians call special revelation. That means that's God pulling down the veil. Maybe you could think of it as peekaboo but saying, look, see. So how has God done that? Well, the faith, as we've understood it for 2,000 years, is that God has done so in various ways. One of them uh, is through the very existence of God's efforts in time. The testimony of Scripture is to what God has done, and they have seen, and how they've understood it. That's the testimony of human beings living in a world and seeing things like I spoke of, but seeing it in, effort, in historical sense, what's going on in their lives, they felt this must be of God. Much of that we find in Scripture, but we'll turn to there in a minute. So through prophets and teachers and all of those sorts that we read about in the Bible, but most correctly, most clearly, and most importantly, through Jesus Christ himself. 
does God reveal God's self. Jesus Christ lifts the veil and shows us aspects of God that we could not otherwise know on our own. Simply consider how the world saw God prior to Jesus Christ. God was an angry deity that had laws that if you failed to obey them to the letter, you simply would die, or should. A God that did not care for you unless you directed all love towards that God in a way appropriate and defined by that God. Now this does not mean that God was wrong or not present in their lives. It means the fullness of understanding that God is love became apparent when God chose to drop the veil in the life of Jesus Christ. That is our most important way. And then the third way is going to be very, I'm going to turn to and, and give more time to it because it is through the written word of God, the Holy Scriptures. And this is at the very heart, this issue of everything that is separating and dividing us today in our church. And I'll turn to that in a little bit. But I want you to think in terms of God chose to pull down the veil through interacting with humanity throughout all time. And we see that in the scriptures. God to chose to reveal more of the nature of God in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, and de demonstrate for us the true nature of the extent, as best we are able to receive it, of God's love for us and God's desire for our love and God's desire we love one another. This is special revelation, meaning God needs to be the person pulling down the veil. There's no way we can see around it on our own. There's no way we could perceive what lies behind it, lest God had chosen to reveal God's self. That's revelation. I want to turn specifically to the Holy Scriptures. This passage of Scripture, you, you, the, we read, um, or we read you as a passage from Paul, and I'm going to read a paragraph that incorporates that Scripture to help you see how spiritual authority is understood in this document. With St. Paul, we affirm that all Scripture is, in, is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Scripture is trustworthy. Scripture is trustworthy as God's revealed word to us, guiding us through the real and difficult circumstances of life, not only in theory or when life is easy. As we progress on the way of discipleship, we grow in this confidence in the truthfulness of God's word because we find it so in our experience of grace. In this way, Scripture's authority leads and directs our experience rather than the other way around. The circumstances of our lives then provide the occasions in which even contrary to appearances, we are able to test and find that God is true and faithful and his word is reliable. All right, so scripture is beneficial and useful, absolutely. Does it contain God's word? Most assuredly. Does it contain the story of how people interacted with God and how they perceived that interaction? Without a doubt. But it was written a long time ago. It was written in a culture that we can barely understand. We try to, we know something about it by a people that lived in a very different age and had a different understanding of what life looked like. These people lived very short, sometimes very difficult lives, lives in which they suffered in ways that we cannot begin to perceive, really, because we live in a time where we have much better health, we have much better resources, and we are able to extend life, and we see it extending every year. That was not an issue for them that they could consider or hope for. They saw people who lived longer, certainly, but for the vast majority, especially for the males, if you made it to mid-40s, you were an old man. That's simply how it was. And women oftentimes would be worked so uh, completely out and had several issues with childbirth because there was no really good way to help them also suffered greatly in their lives. It was a uniform suffering from our perspective and our time. Yet also, as human beings, they loved and they rejoiced. But if you do not understand about who they were and where they were living and the experiences they were having, 
it's much more difficult to understand how they viewed the words that they were recording for us to read into this very day. So it requires interpretation, and interpretation is where we get into all the trouble. It's not that it's wrong, it absolutely has to be done, but let me just give you a little bit of history there. Now, one of my things that I've spent a lot of time in my life studying is the history of theology. It simply means how did we start, which this is trying to present, and how did we get to where we are today? And it's kind of a way of, of watching the step-by-step -step changes that take place, what's been added and then taken away and added back then we have things like that. Something that existed and was absolute generations of people lived and died believing and was written away just like that. Those things are a part of the history of theology. And in the United Methodist Church and indeed in the traditions of Methodism that go beyond the Methodist Church and go back in time, we adopted a particular way that we offer as an example of how to interpret scripture. And that starts with scripture. That's the beginning place then follows reason, experience, and tradition. I have to look at all of those because we've changed in how we see that too. So when this first was defined for us and given as sort of an example of how to interpret scripture for you and I and anybody, scripture was primary. Scripture stood apart from the other three. Scripture was what scripture said. And you approach that scripture by trying to utilize your reason. Every one of us have been given a mind to think and reason. Indeed, in the scriptures, God invites us. God says, come, let us reason together. We have a mind, every one of us, and we have reason. And so we can utilize that reason in understanding scripture. Experience. Now, oftentimes, people confuse this one. They think that means the experience of the Christian church of 2,000 years. It does not. That certainly plays a role, but what it means is your own experience. What life have you lived? Where have you come from? When I read the scriptures growing up in this part of the country, in my day, in my time, never having suffered very much any kind of poverty or loss other than the natural losses we all have, I read scripture differently than somebody standing in the Middle East today and be a Christian can mean their lives. I read it differently than people who experienced a history of slavery in which their families were treated as being possessions of someone. I've never had such an experience. I read scripture differently than they, perhaps. All of us come to it from a different way of life, a different experience. Men tend to read scripture different from women. That not, should not be considered unusual. Our experiences do differ, do they not, in some regards. Experience is our experience and the experience that we have in the homes that we've grown up in and the people we live with. And that's how we read scripture too. Tradition is where we come into the part that deals with what has been handed down to us. This is a document of tradition. The faith once delivered is the tradition of faith. And these are things that those who have also approached scripture with the intent to interpret it have utilized their gifts, their knowledge, their experience, their traditions that they received to try to give us a way to read scripture for us, to help us, to guide us. That's all doctrine really is, you know. It's stuff to help us learn. It, it means teaching for a reason. It's to help us to know and understand what others have done and brought to the table so that we can read scripture and feast on it ourselves. That also, though, is an important aspect to recognize that what they have done is good work. Even though, as I've told you, it's changed over time, how they read scripture in the 1920s is very different than how they read scripture in the 1960s, and how they read scripture in the 1960s is a world of difference in how they read them in 2022, let me tell you. So what is good on this? What does this help with? Well, it helps us to approach scripture, but what happens when scripture stops being the primary and becomes only one aspect of these other three? In other words, scripture, reason, experience, tradition hold an equal basis. That wasn't the way this was designed, it wasn't the way it was developed, but in many quarters today, that is the way it has become. So when we approach scripture, from a critical uh, understanding of theology and, and approach to interpretation, 
Scripture is no different than if you are a uh, a Shakespeare um, scholar approaching one of his great works or his great works in totality. It's read in the same way. Trying to understand context, tradition, methodology, all of that. Some people feel that's how scripture should be read, some theologians. Therefore, reason, experience, tradition are equally important. And if your reason, experience, and tradition differ with what you read in scripture, then scripture has to give way. That's very important. It lays at the very heart of what I'll talk about in just a minute. But think about this. If you read scripture and you want to do it in a way that reflects the humility that we must have, you approach it realizing you are doing so from the perspective of your own reason. You're doing so from the perspective of what you have experienced in life and do not discount how much that in affects how you read scripture. Very different in how you read scripture if you're reading about the love of God and you're dealing with a deadly form of cancer that might take your life and you're seeing it ebb away. You might not see it in the same way someone who has not experienced that. It may have all the meaning in the world to you, but it also might mean that you wonder and question the love of God. Experience means everything when it comes to reading scripture and we have to acknowledge it. Tradition too. Methodists read scripture pretty much the way most Protestants read scripture, but we don't all read it the same. Our traditions play a very big role in how we approach scripture. If you have grown up in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, you have heard scripture interpreted in a very particular way, or the Lutheran Church, or the Congregational Church, or the Moravian Church, and I can go on and on. You have heard it through a particular tradition, and you need to know that. It's critical that we have the humility to understand that when we approach scripture, it is primary, in my view, and we approach it from these aspects of who we are. And that means we as an individual. It also means we as a collective a people, a community of faith. It means we as theologians. It means we as a denomination. It means we as the Christian church. It's when we acknowledge that, that I think we begin to find a way where we can talk about it. So let's just take the big division in our church today, which is causing schism. And it's not just in two we're looking at potential. We're looking much worse than that, perhaps. We won't know for a few years. But what lies at the heart of that? You have heard it's all about sexuality. That is not true. Sexuality has become that particular thing out there that they have used to argue about something altogether else. And I greatly hate that. I I feel bad about that. I repent of the church for doing it because that has hurt people. It has hurt people again and again. It has divided people. It's caused people to doubt who they are as an individual. It's caused families to be divided over one person's way of life and another. That, my friends, is sin in my view. So what is dividing us? What is pulling us apart? Why are we doing this to ourselves and to others? It has to do with scripture, reason, experience, and tradition. So let me explain. On one part of the church today are those who think scripture literally is, as I stated, of no more or greater import than perhaps the great works of literature. And it needs to be read that way and understood that way and limited in time in that way. Not too many of us speak in Shakespearean English except those very gifted uh, actors that can do that. It's context. It's the, the way that it has been understood. And it is subject to and ought to be subject to reason, experience, and tradition. Therefore, malleable, changeable. You can go in and say, you know, I, this part really speaks to me, but this part doesn't, so I will attend to what speaks to me, and I will either ignore or deny what does not. That is one aspect of our church today. Scholars, clergy, theologians, church folk. Very much true. Scriptures mean just what it is. Something written a long time ago with some really good stuff in it. Some very good lessons of life that you can pick and choose from as you choose. And that's how they interpret the church. That's one extreme on one side. And there are many who go that way. On the other side, the other extreme, 
are those who look at Scripture and say, this is literally the word of God, word for word. They don't see it as meaning something different in a different time. It means exactly what it said then. It means exactly what it means now. And they apply no critical analysis. There is no sense of understanding that I approach Scripture from my own reason, my own experience, my own tradition. They not only set Scripture as first, as I agree it should be, and principle, as I agree it should be, but they put it so far out there as to be unapproachable. And they deny that they utilize their reason, experience, and tradition just like everybody else. And doing so, divide folk. Both sides in the, uh, I've given you, these two extremes, are what are pulling our churches apart. They literally are. And there's, of course, all sorts of people in between. You know, some sympathize this way, some that way. Some are right smack in the middle, where we, we United Methodists used to be very proud of what we called the middle way. Try to find yourself in the middle way, and you might be like a skunk in the middle of the road, my friends, that encountered a bad encounter with a truck. It is a bad place to be today because those people have pulled us apart. So what is the tradition that we have had? What is it that is Wesleyan? What is it that the faith gave us? A sense of humility, a sense of reading scripture and knowing it is containing the word of God. It's containing the story of people's experience of God, knowing that this is God revealed to us in some context through the, excuse me, especially through the son of God. It is absolutely unique. There is no other document like it in this world, and there never will be. That is fact. But having the humility to understand that you bring to that reading, I bring to that reading, we all do, your reason, your experience, and the traditions you've grown up under. And that does not make that false, by the way. That makes it very true. For you and for me, perhaps. Perhaps this is exactly what you believe. I believe the faith once delivered. That is my faith. I believe that to be the traditional faith at Christian church. I think it's fundamental. But I also have at least enough humility to understand that other people don't always agree with me. In fact, there's a whole lot that would disagree with me. And I recognize that like I, they too bring their reason, experience, and tradition. So I ask you, is it okay to disagree? Is it okay not to agree on every matter? Do any of you live in a household, husbands and wives, parents, children, grandparents, where everybody's in lockstep agreement? Do you not occasionally have, shall we say, disagreements? Different ways of understanding the world? We see it in politics today all the time. I've seen homes divided by Republican, Democrat, and the independents going, you know, People won't talk to each other because they voted for somebody they didn't like or didn't vote for somebody they did. That is in homes too, is it not? And yet we can disagree often in families and most often, I pray always for you, we find a way to forgive, do we not? We find a way to live together. Why? Because we love each other. We love one another. Can you come to hate your child because your child disagrees with you about who to vote for? I don't think so. I know I surely can. And let me tell you the truth, most of my kids vote differently than I do. <laughs> Makes for some interesting family gatherings, does it not? What if in the church, just thinking here, that we decided that we were going to understand that we all read scripture and we all ought to, regardless of what we call ourselves, United Methodist, Global Methodist, or whatever else is out there, of which there is something like, I think, 174 or five denominations, take your pick, of Christian church. What if we were to read scripture individually and collectively and as a church, giving it absolute primacy in our understanding of what it means to live in this life, looking for God's word in it, but having the humility to recognize that we bring something to the reading, that this is what we believe, we should stand on what we believe, absolutely, but if someone disagrees with us and sees it differently, perhaps they read something different into the passages of scripture, even the teachings of Jesus, God forbid, 
Can we at least come away with it still loving them, caring for them, seeing them as a brother or a sister? Because let me tell you something, God does. You see, this is something we have to remember in every moment. And if it doesn't teach us humility, I don't know what is. This is not our right to decide right and wrong. That is God's. That's what got us in all the trouble from the beginning. Because we thought we could be our own God. What do we need God for? I know it's right and wrong. You want to live under my decisions? My dictatorship? No, you do not. And nor do I want to live under yours. God directs our lives and ways towards love and acceptance of one another, walking together in disagreement, yes, but loving one another nonetheless. Perhaps wanting to argue about this or that political issue, sure. But can't you set it aside? Will you waste a relationship with another because of it? Would you turn someone away because they didn't look like you? Would you turn someone away because they disagreed with you if they needed your help? I hope not. Jesus certainly taught you and I better. And I think your parents did too, and mine did, I know. At least they tried to. So what is this whole thing about? What is it that I'm trying to say to you today? What I'm trying to say to you today is believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Hold them close to your hearts. Live in accordance with the teachings of Jesus, of loving God and loving neighbor with all you are. Read what he tells us we ought to do and how we ought to live. Absolutely walk in those steps. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But recognize not everybody is in the same place you are in life. Not everyone has experienced life as you or I have. Not everyone has the same traditions or reasons in the same way. Some people have suffered in ways we can't imagine. And when they read about the love of God, they need a little time. They need a little understanding. Some people have seen hatred in their lives that would absolutely cause us to cry and shudder. And all they ask of us is just to be patient with them as God is patient with us all. So what am I saying to you today? Well, we divide ourselves and what we are doing is not what God is asking us to do. What God is asking us to do as the faith once revealed demonstrates is to simply love God, be loved by God and love one another as we love ourselves. And every one of us wants to be loved, respected and honored for who we are, do we not? That's the faith. That's the faith that was handed down to us. What we do with it in our time will be what people will look forward to seeing in their lives as they grow up. I pray they look forward to good things, good examples, because our children desperately need good examples today because there are so many bad Till next time, God bless you. We have, special, we have some very special music here to lead us into our communion today. And uh, I'm really looking forward. This is one of my very favorite songs, by the way. Thank you.
You won't need your hymnals today. I'm going to use a shorter version as I took a little longer than I anticipated. Just got to find it. Lift up your hearts and give them give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and came to dwell among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you destroyed the power of sin and death. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave it to, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that in unity we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at your table forever through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now will you join with me in our Lord's Prayer? Our Father. Join me up front, please.
And Jesus said, this is my body being broken for you. As often as you eat of it, remember me. the end of the supper, Jesus took cup and blessed it and said, this is my blood of the new covenant being shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, remember me. Now, dear friends, let us pray. Loving God, you have spoken to us in so many ways. You cry out to us from the beauty of a child's face, from the flower, from the trees, from the sky, and, and the wonderments of what lies beyond our vision that is being revealed to us. You speak out in glorious ways saying, I am here and I am your God and I have created you spoke to us through Jesus Christ and many others, but Jesus in a particular way to say to us, I am here and I love you and I do everything I can to give you life. Hear what I say, follow where I lead and know life. And you've spoken to us in this moment through this simple ritual that was taught to us by our Lord Jesus. He was called on us, remember, remember these things, hold them dear and live them. Live them in your lives with one another, with your community, with your world. Love God with all that you are, Jesus said, and love your neighbors yourself. These are testimonies made real in the bread and in the wine. Thank you, God, for the grace of meeting us where we live, of guiding us to a better place. All of this we give thanks for in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our closing hymn, and thank you for bearing with me a little later today, is May God's Blessings.
Have a blessed day. Hope you can stay for a little coffee if you can. Otherwise, please go in peace and God be with you.